Hi everyone, uh, I'm Somitra. So first I will quickly show you how to set up the uh, VM for those who have still not uh, have their VM up. Uh, so once you have that zip file, just extract that zip file, select on new, give any name, select type as Linux, <coughs> and version as Red Hat 64 bit. Click next, uh, then it will ask for memory. So give as much RAM as possible uh, because whatever we will be doing, it will be memory intensive. So for 8 GB systems, try giving at least 3 GB RAM, and for 4 GB systems, try giving at least uh, like 1800 MB RAM. So once you assign the RAM, then you have to select this use an existing virtual hard drive file and browse to that VDI image, whatever you have, ex uh, whatever file you got after extracting that zip file, uh, select that file and just click on create, it will create the VM and you can just uh, click on start to start the uh, VM. Um, any confusion in this part? Some of you, I guess, don't have that VM up and running because of some dependency or any other things. So I think the only option is to pair up. What about the login? Uh, username is solar user, password is solar user. Anywhere it's asking for password, it's solar user. So can you briefly tell us what is there inside? Yeah. Uh, what patches is Yeah. Ah. User. Password is same as username. Mm -hmm. yeah. Solar user. Mm So I will quickly go through what's all there in this uh, image. So first of all, there are basic applications like you have a browser, you have Eclipse, you have an editor, and you have a uh, SQL client. Uh, we will be importing data from MySQL and introducing it to Solar. Uh, we will use uh, the SQL client. Then all of the the main work which we will do is it inside this work directory. Everything we will be doing as solar user. So inside solar user you will see two folders, one is tools and other is work. So tools has Installer for all the things. Uh, you need not worry about all those things because uh, they are already installed. Inside work directory, you will see first of all there is a solar, solar package. Then there is Zookeeper. Then there is sample data, uh, Eclipse, and all those things is not required. So basically, there are three things. All the sample data has instructions for all the hands-on activities plus the sample data. Uh, which will be required for each of the hands-on activities. So if you will see the content of sample data folder, uh, it is based on activities and inside every activity, there are there is data required for that activity plus readme file uh, which, tells, uh, which gives you the instructions for that activity. And instead of, uh, some of you might not be familiar with the command line, so I think you guys can open, the, open this sublime text and in the left hand pane you will see um, all the readme files and all those things. So first thing I want all of you to just open the sublime editor and um, open this uh, sample data folder. Fine. 
to try to open the PDF file. It says kernel to be loaded. Yeah, there is some module missing on that stuff. Let's take it. Yeah. So do we need to download anything? I think it would be faster if you can pair up as well. Yeah, it's with this one. You have system up and running, right? Yeah, I have seen all of So how many of you don't have the image running? Can you please? Can you just switch and sit with someone who has system running? Anyone who don't have system running, make sure that uh, you have some partner for the hands-on activities. You guys If you guys want to change the you can just quickly shut them. I will just go through the theory first and then we will troubleshooting. So the agenda of this session is to understand the out of box features of solar and try to understand how we can implement our distributed search platform using solar. So we have a pretty ambitious agenda. Um, I will try to cover most of the things but we will skim through some of the things. Um, our aim will be to at least understand like what all capabilities solar has and how you can solve your use case using solar. So first, like, let's try to see what is the basic requirement for a search application. So whenever you want to build a search application, uh, there are a few basic things which you will always need. Uh, first thing is you want a basic full text search. You want to enter something and you want to see results for that. You want highlighting of your search terms in your document wherever that search term has matched. Then you want some sorting criteria, like you want to sort your results based on some fields on some criteria, you want sorting capabilities, uh, you want pagination, you don't want to show user all the results at one time, you want to paginate those things. Then you want something like called faceting. So you might have seen this, uh, this thing in uh, Flipkart or another e-commerce site, where for every category you get a count, like for this category I have this many results. So this is called faceting. So solar provides you with faceting also. Then you have some basic charting capabilities. Can you use the mic? Oh. <coughs> yeah, so solar provides you with uh, faceting capabilities. Then all the time based filtering, all those things. Then there is something called clustering. Whatever results you get, you might want to cluster those results <coughs> together into some groups so that user can more easily skim through the results. So all these type of features, uh, they are provided out of box by Solar and we will see how we can build all these features today. So how is clustering different from this? 
so in clustering you get groups like i have like 250 matches out of these 250 matches uh, solar tries to cluster group create some groups like it tries to create this commercial quadcopter groups and assign some of the documents in those groups faceting is you are getting number of uh, faceting we will cover that in more detail it's a little bit that topic we will cover that when we go forward uh, it's completely different uh, clustering is completely different from faceting so solar basically what solar is solar is a search platform it's a search server you put in some documents in solar and then you can provide search features on that uh, like in databases you have the smallest entity as row so in solar the smallest entity is uh, documents and what exactly is a document a uh, document is consists of number of attributes and number of fields So our document looks like this. So this is very important to understand because uh, sometimes people get confused at starting itself like uh, how does solar store things. So this is important to understand that uh, what is the basic entity in solar then we will uh, go on to discuss other things. So a document consists of nothing but some fields and each field can have some data type and um, multi -valued, uh, values or, and things like that. So like this I have one document and this document has many fields like ST tags, ST site and all those things. This comprises of one document and similarly there can be multiple documents. Each of that document can have uh, similar uh, many fields. And if you are familiar with NoSQL, then in Solar also you every document need not have all the attributes. Some of the documents can have this ST tag fields, some of the documents cannot. So with this little introduction about document, uh, uh, we will see uh, how solar is built. So solar is basically built on top of Apache Lucene. Uh, Lucene provided all this functionality and all this search functionalities like faceting, scoring and all those things. And what solar did was uh, Lucene, in Lucene, when you are using Lucene, everything you have to write code for everything. You have to write Java code for everything. So what solar did was it exposed all those features as configuration options. So instead of writing code what you can do to achieve all these things you can directly uh, do some configuration and you will get those things for instance if you want to have sorting on some field then directly you can define your schema that i want to have sorting on this field and uh, you will get the job done so lucene is very scalable uh, scalable super fast and you can get like 150 gb per hour level of uh, uh, indexing speed in most of the cases, Lucene and Solar will never be the bottleneck for your applications uh, because it's very fast. Uh, it's, uh, the bottleneck becomes like how fast can you index your data. So Solar basically it provides API to access Lucene over HTTP and it also added some additional features like uh, distributed search and replication and all those things it added on top of uh, Lucene. So one thing people get confused at starting is that they think that Solar is <coughs> can be used as a database. So even though since Solar 4, Solar added uh, functionality which are similar to a NoSQL database, but it should not be used as a NoSQL database. Otherwise, over the time, um, its performance will uh, get affected very badly. So we will see what are the performance factors which should be kept in mind uh, while creating a schema and while indexing documents. So all these features like faceting more like this, and these are further added by Solar. A uh, good thing about Solar is you can write your own plugins, you can plug in extra components like this clustering component. So clustering component is not built in Solar, it is actually using a software called Caret. So actually whenever you are saying clustering in Solar, it means Caret uh, clustering. So we can plug in ex uh, extra softwares into Solar very easily. 
So we will see. We will have a quick overview of what indexing and querying means. So as we saw that basic entity. Yeah, in the end we will try to see if we have time left, we will definitely go through that. So we have seen that the basic entity in solar is a document. A uh, document consists of many fields. So people coming from relational uh, database background, you can assume a document as a single row. But that row need not have all the columns. So in traditional RDBMS, in a table, every row must have all the columns. Otherwise you need to assign some null values or like that. Uh, in this and in a solar document, some of the attributes can be present, some of the attributes cannot be present, just like in any in NoSQL database. You can compare it equivalent to Cassandra or something. So, raw data goes into our parser and we create a document out of that raw data. What that document consists of? That document consists of fields. And inside that fields, so Raw data. So first of all, let me tell you what data we will try to index today. Uh, we will try to index uh, data from uh, Stack Exchange sites. Stack Exchange sites. You must be familiar with like Stack Overflow, Robotics, and all those things. So they provide the dumps for all their data, and it consists of all the stats like uh, all the questions asked, all the answer received, what is the score of all each of the posts. So that data we will try to index. <coughs> So in this document, you can see there are fields like robotics. So it tells that this uh, data belongs to the robotics side. Then it tells something like what is the post type. So post type is question. Then what is the actual post and number of comments that post got, what is the title of that post and favorite count and all those fields. And you will see that this title field, this title field will be present only for questions. So in Stack Overflow, if you go, only the questions will have title, answers don't have title. So this title field will be present only in documents where uh, post type is equal to questions. So we have a, we had some raw data, we converted that raw data into a document and by the document we meant that we split that data into some fields. And then inside that field, every field has some terms. So all this data will eventually be converted into uh, tokens or you can simplify that as terms. So this ST post data, let's say this title data, it will be broken into tokens like what is the, like that. So document had field and that field went through analyzer. That analyzer broke that field data into terms. And those terms are written into a data structure uh, which we call as inverted index. And inverted index is the basic data structure that is used by both uh, Lucene and Solar. So that is the flow for indexing. So let's see what inverted index is. Suppose we have this document, the bright blue butterfly hangs on the breeze. This document went through analysis phase. And in analysis phase, we do many things. A simple thing which we do is we have a stop word list. So there are some words which a user will never be interested in searching for. Like the uh, user never searches for those things. So during the analysis phase, we remove all those words and then finally it's broken into terms and that terms goes into the inverted index. So you can see that for bright uh, uh, we have a term. Basically we have tokens for all the terms apart from the ones which are in the stop word list. So you can say that this part is the analysis phase and there are a lot of other things in which happens during the analysis uh, stage and at the end we get an inverted index. Inverter index basically consists of a mapping between the term and the documents in which that term is present. Like the word best. So best is present only in document 2. So it will store that best in document 2. Now this term blue, it is present in document 1 and 3. So blue is present here, blue is present here, it's present in both document 1 and 3. So this is this data structure is called inverter index. And the reason why you see this so fast is because of this. Whenever user comes and search for any term, we have we already have that mapping. So whenever user search for bright, we directly go in this data structure and we get the list, we get list of all the documents uh, which have this uh, term bright, and then we can uh, later perform other operation. There are certain use cases where this data structure doesn't work. So we also have an 
uninverted uh, index, but that use cases are very few. So in that case, we have our in inverted indexing. The, like we stored that for document one, what all tokens are there. Um, but we will focus only on in cases where inverted indexes involved. Uh, also, what does it, is this ranking or can you ranking? Yeah, ranking we will, during query we will see ranking. So, so these are basic concepts uh, which will come, uh, like term frequency is the number of times a document has occurred in a document. So, like in document two, or in, what is the number of times a term has occurred in a certain document? That is term frequency. And you didn't store that, right? Uh, term frequency would be able to store that. We are just we will consider that while querying and all those things. Then there is inverted document frequency. Um, it tells us uh, our basic goal is. If we only go by term frequency, then we will not always get good results. Because suppose we might have one very large document, it might have some terms repeating 10 times, and at the same time we might have a very small document, it might have a term repeating only twice or thrice. If we just go by term frequency, then we don't, we will not get good results. So we try to calculate what is the weight of that uh, term in, a, in that document. So we kind of normalize that score based on uh, the length of the documents. So, and based on that, we calculate what is the weight of that term. So, we will cover this while covering uh, query. So, this is the architecture <coughs> for uh, Solar. At the core of the Solar is the Lucene, and Lucene provides all the index searcher and all the query parsers. Uh, query parser basically means, uh, I mean, you can specify its different kind of query language. So there are multiple query parsers and each query parser has some additional advantages. Some provides uh, easy way to specify boosting and all those things. So all these things come from Apache Lucene. And then on top of that, Solar added some other things like data import handler. Data import handler helps us to ex import data from external sources. Uh, we can import data from databases, XML file, or even crawl uh, from the web. Then Tika, it helps in uh, indexing rich text documents like PDF. Then index handlers, it uh, helps us in uh, specifying how we want to control our index and what operation we want to do on that. Then replication of index. So if you want to have multiple copies of our index for uh, fault tolerance and high availability, then we can replicate. So these things are added by Solar. Lucene only provided the core functionality is the single node thing. And on top of that, Solar added a uh, lot of things. Then Solar can run in any jQuery container. So by default, it comes uh, with a jetty. So whenever you start Solar, it will start. It will deploy your application on jetty and it will start on some board. Then it provides a schema and metadata configuration. So what whatever things you did through programming in Lucene, it abstracted those things as lot of things as configuration and you can specify all those things as metadata configuration then it provides you clients and client apis to access your index so what we will quickly do now is uh, we will fire up uh, one solar instance uh, we will try to see what all is included in the solar and understand the basically directory layout because uh, there are so many examples bundled in the package so Anyone using Solar for the first time, it's become very difficult to figure out like what directory means for. And let us give you in more detail. So if you all can just open this activity one and just open the readme file for activity one. So first thing we have to do is uh, we have to start a single node solar instance. So question, the tags that we can they control the tags? As in, can we decrease the number of times, increase the number of times? Tags? Yeah. In this document? Yes. Yeah, this is, I mean this is your data. This tags is nothing but a multi-valued field. So whatever data you are putting, this is under your control. 
so st tags is the field name and this is the uh, this is the value of those tags uc tags when a second let me open it so whenever you have any uh, document from stack overflow at the end you have some tags like what all the categories it belongs to so while indexing our documents so this tags are coming from the data itself i mean it's not some predefined thing so any other document it can have tags like php jquery and ajax so it's just a multi value field all these are fields same corresponding to that document and we need to define this thing so all this field definition uh, this is called schema definition and we will see in this example like how we can uh, define a schema and all those things so like you said that the document is like a no code so like can we add new fields in the solar yeah yeah you can add it and we can search on that yeah yeah you can always it's very dynamic so you can today you have some requirements so you have defined some fields you uh, tomorrow some new requirements can come up you can uh, add new fields and it will so index on top of that data or just index in the new you can just index in the new fields uh, if you want the old documents also to get updated okay. then you have to reindex the old document also okay. yeah so if i change the index and it will index it yeah <coughs> and if you can just open up the terminal and go inside work and solar 481 directory so here you will see um, one example folder one example final and one example minimum folder um, i will explain uh, in just couple of minutes what all these things mean but for now just go to example minimal folder so i am here at home solar user work solar 481 example minimal and once you are there just type this command java hyphen jar start dot jar it will start up a solar it will basically fire up a jetty instance uh, deploy solar var over there and it will start on default 8983 port Make any mistake, then you will see this thing. Registered new server. Okay, so it will tell you that it has started at port eight nine eight three. Now, if you will open your browser. Eight nine eight three. It will give you a list uh, of contacts available on the server. Just click the default one, or you can di just directly go to localhost eight nine eight three slash solar. Let me know if anyone has any problems so far. So this is the basic admin UI for solar. It provides lot of informations. You can do lot of things from here itself. So what we did just now is we started a single node solar. 
here you will see something like code selector it will show something like collection one so this is our default example that comes bundled uh, when you download uh, solar collection is uh, equivalent to our table in our DBMS so for a collection you define the schema and, and then you index documents into a collection uh, this something called instance directory also yeah, this is the instance directory and whatever, whatever instance you are running as, this is called, in, basically whatever, one instance of Jetty is called an instance in Solar Vocab. So this is, I have just launched a one Solar instance. And uh, for any instance you can have multiple collections? In each instance you can have multiple collections. So you can have multiple instances of Solar running on, a, on one machine. Inside each instance, you can have a multiple collection. Basically, instances are separately indexed, queried, etc. They don't see each other. No, they see each other. That yeah, they communicate with each other. So instances are the way um, that we distribute our search. So shards. Sh shards is one mode level for deep of abstraction. It's like when you start. <coughs> multiple nodes, right? On let's say Cassandra or any background you are familiar with. Like Hadoop. You start Hadoop on multiple nodes, right? So you have multiple instances of Hadoop running. So it's equivalent to that. Now you when you are running a pseudo cluster, if you want you can run <laughs> you can run uh, like multiple instances on same machine also. So it's equivalent to that. We will cover more about instances when we come to solar cloud. Yeah, so it basically provides you some report information like how much memory you have, uh, heap size, all those things. Uh, plus, it provides you all the properties. And most important thing, it provides you a list of collections that you have. If you select at some, if you select the report collection, it will tell you how many number of documents are present in that collection. And documents, as I mentioned earlier, is equivalent to number of rows. So let's leave it up to here. So everyone got this admin UI up and running? Okay. So now we will try to see. Uh, see, I'm not able to run it. I'm getting some error. What's the error? No bootable No bootable. Virtual machine? Oh, you are still at virtual machine? <laughs> you can tell us, I agree. Okay. So first we will try to understand the directory structure of solar. So at the base level, you will have many things. Just focus on this example thing. So this, uh, one thing to remember with solar is names are very confusing in solar and always try, try not the names uh, to get you confused. So example here in solar means a server. So whenever you download <laughs> solar, yeah, so there is a Jira open for changing the terminology uh, for uh, all these things. So here example means, uh, one example means one server directory, okay? So you can have multiple, you can make multiple copies of example directories and that way you can run multiple instances on uh, same machine. So what I have did is, I have made a two copies of this example folder. So I have actually made two copies of the server folder. One is example minimum. In the example minimum, I have removed all the extra stuff which uh, makes it confusing for the first time. And then I have an example final uh, where I have put all the stuff so that you guys can take reference from that. So whatever we will do, we will do inside this example minimal directory. We will take reference from the uh, whatever I have mentioned in that activity docs just from this example final directory. So if if we will go in one more level deep, that is inside server directory. Yeah. So apart from the server directory, there are other directories like disk. So if we have some other package like uh, clustering component or data import handler. So if you want to include other things, we can put uh, those jars inside this, uh, this folder and those will be uh, visible to the uh, solar. So then if we go inside the example folder, again, you will see a lot of directories which might confuse you for the first time. 
but main directory is that solar is the directory called solar. So this is the directory which will store your actual collection, uh, your actual index, schema, and all the configuration. So basically, all the configurations, uh, all the schema definitions, and all the actual data that will be inside solar directory. There is other directory called scripts directory. So it has uh, some other scripts for doing stuff like uploading files to Zookeeper and all those things. Then there is a jar called star.jar. So <coughs> Star.jar will start your uh, solar basically it will fire up a jetty instance it will uncompress mm -hmm. uncompress the files and it will deploy the var file basically so whenever we have to start the solar we can just give this uh, java jar star.jar and it will start up the solar mm -hmm. now it will go inside the solar directory again we will see something so the only thing that is of, of our concern is collection one so collection one as i mentioned is equivalent to a table so all the data will be stored inside the solar plus configuration also. So how you create uh, uh, collections is first you define some configuration for a collection. Just like how you create a, uh, a tables in RDBMS, you first uh, define a create table statement and that uh, creates your table. Then you index some data. So equivalent to that in here also, uh, for to create a collection, we have to first define some configuration like what all fields will be there for that collection and uh, what all other parameters will be there for that collection. Then when we index the data, then this data directory is created. So it will hold the actual data. And we can configure this data directory and we can, we can put it somewhere else also. So yeah, now we will see what all configuration is required to create a new collection. So again, if you you can ignore all these files and just focus on two files. There is schema.xml and solarconfig.xml. Uh, rest of the files you can copy it uh, from the example itself. So whenever we want to create a new collection, uh, the only thing we have to define is, we have to define a schema. Uh, like what all fields will be there in the document. So we will talk about a schema and for that we will just open the um, schema file for this collection one. So inside this example minimal directory, if I go inside solar, collection one, con. So here I have my schema file and let's open this file and see uh, what all fields are there, what all things are there inside. So in a schema, basically you define three things. First thing you define is the primary key for your documents. Then you define the fields which will be there in your documents. And it's not necessary that every document will have every field, but whatever fields you want to have uh, in all the documents, you can define all those uh, fields over here. Then you have to define the uh, data type for uh, your field. So for example, like I have defined only three fields. Uh, one is ID, title, and text. And then I have defined the data type for this uh, fields: string, string, and text uh, In solar, you can create your there. It comes bundled with lot of data types. Plus, you can create your uh, own data types. So here in solar, we don't call it data types. We call it uh, field types. So string, string, and text TN, These are like uh, bundled field types. And we, if we want, we can create our own field types. So first thing was this unique key. So you have to specify one field uh, which will be treated as unique key. And unique key has to be there in every document. Uh, there are some cases where you can not where you can ignore having unique key, um, but it's always good to have a unique key. Uh, unique key and primary key are the same. Uh, the difference is that primary key you need to have in RDBMS sense. Yes. In Solar, you, there are some cases where you can avoid having ID field. Those cases are very few and very rare. Uh, most of the time, people always have ID field, but you can uh, ignore that thing. You have to define that. So, you, as you can see here, I have defined a field named ID, and I have defined the type of that thing as string. So. These three things are there. First is the ID field, then fields, and then the definition of the data types, or whatever data types you want to use. So
so there are some uh, default data types plus now plus there are some complex data types so data types define what type of operations you want to have on that field like if you have a document coming a stream of document text coming in what type of analysis you want to perform on that thing like you might want more, you might want to remove the stoppers you might want to convert the upper case to lower case so a field type define all those things like what all operations you want to uh, do on that stream of raw text before you finally put it into your index so we can create our own data types also okay so for now just try to understand this that we have defined three fields id title and text now we will first index one document and see how it goes into solar and then we will uh, discuss things later uh, so now if you will refer the readme file for activity fund activity one it will tell you how to index some documents and uh, basically you have to go to this activity one folder and there is a utility called post.jar that will index document into uh, solar and when i say index it basically means insert document into solar so just go inside this activity one folder before posting let me show you what so is is inside the doc, docs folder so inside docs folder i have two documents and this is what my document look like it's basically a xml document it has it has three fields id title and text and it, there there is some value for this three fields any question so far so every time you have to create xml file no 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 push it or you can use csv format you can use a bunch of no for maybe we have another option to csv you can use csv json just binary there are a lot of um, format which so in your example you are taking up only yeah xml file yeah to java yeah in fact this thing also i mean defining the fields also you can ignore and there is a schema less mode where it will automatically try to understand the type and what the what all fields are there for a document uh, but for but simplicity then, sake we are just going with xml for now but uh, but then in that thing you would have to name the name the fields in a place no no it, yeah that's what there solar can detect those things also for you uh, for now uh, let's keep it aside it will create an okay so let's try to index this document so just uh, run this command this is mentioned in the readme.txt file inside activity 1 so it will tell you uh, that one file index it will show you the time it has taken to index that file so what index means it took the file it basically broke it, it basically broke it into fields then it analyzed it did analysis on those fields it broke it into tokens and it finally put those tokens inside the inverted index so let's if let's see what it looks like in the admin ui so if we'll go into the admin ui it will show you number of documents one so it has basically index one document uh, let me know if any and has questions so far everyone is able to index one document what are those num docs and max docs different yeah so num docs is the uh, total number of documents that are visible to you so max docs actually is, uh, whenever you index documents there is a slight delay in when those things become visible it become visible to you only when you do commit we will cover those things uh, so max docs tell you like uh, what is the actual number of documents are there 
maximum dots tell you number of visible documents. Can we see the data in inverted That would be in binary format. So, you, um, okay, let me open up uh, the directory where the data is. So as I mentioned that all the data and all the configuration resides inside the solar folder and inside solar folder for every different collection uh, there will be a different uh, conf and data directory. So as you can see for collection 1 there is one conf directory and one data directory. Inside this conf directory I have defined that schema and when it, as I enter index this document it went inside this data directory. So inside this data directory you will see two things, one is index and other for this tlog. So index is your actual inverted index. So you can see that it writes in all this in internal file formats. So you won't be able to see raw text actually, it stores all things in binary format. Uh, before writing to index it actually first write to transaction log, this tlog and then it write to index. So whatever you see as max docs is actually sum of this index plus t log, and index is the actual documents which are visible to you. So I have indexed one document. If now if I will do a, this is a select all query. You can assume it as a select all query. What I'm saying to it is that go inside solar, then go inside collection one then select and select what I am telling it to select everything from everything so basically this means field colon value the syntax is uh, field colon value so if, if suppose I only wanted to get results for id field so you type this manually sorry from where you went Okay, and this query you are asking? Yeah. If you will go into this readme file, then you will find this query. After posting these things, open the browser and do a select all query. Everyone is able to follow? Clear? So it is showing, so let us try to understand what is the response I am getting. For the first thing is I am getting a header and header it is showing me the status of my query plus the time it took for that query. So it is showing me that it took 2 milliseconds and status uh, 0 means ok, non 0 means some problem. Then it is showing me the parameters which I passed to the query. Then it's showing me the uh, documents uh, which are available for that query. So it's showing that I have uh, one document for the select all query, and it's showing the actual document. So it's showing the whatever document I have indexed. It's showing uh, that like that. Uh, there is this version field. You can ignore this uh, version field uh, for now. We will discuss it later. What is the use of this version field? Yeah, so basically the idea is we have defined some schema and we have indexed this document and we are able to see this uh, document in our UI. Now if we want, uh, we can do some search on particular field, like if you want to search for this term open. So you can first specify on which field you want to search, like I want to search on text field. Then whatever value you want to search for, you can give after colon, so I want to search for open. So it's now you can see that my query is text open and it still uh, gave me uh, this result. Uh, let's try to index the second document also. No, it's not a standard utility at all. Uh, it's a bundled utility uh, just to quickly get uh, started uh, with indexing documents. Otherwise, you have to use solar GRUs to set up some Java client. It's a time-taking thing. So, for just for beginner's purpose. Yeah, 
we will have yeah most of the time we will have some uh, like most of the time java <coughs> so i will take second document also again if i will do a select a star query then now it's showing me that there are two documents available and these are the two documents both the documents this time have uh, same fields Yes. So one more thing you might see in field definition is, uh, apart from field definition, we one thing we have mentioned for ID field is required equal to true. So this forces Solar uh, to check whether that field is available in that document or not. But this title field and text field we have not defined anything like required equal to true. So now let's try to index some document. We will make a copy of this document. <coughs> and we will remove this text field. We will change the ID. And let's try to post this document. So you can see that in this document, there was no text field. If we will go and do a select star query, you will see that in our third document, uh, there is uh, uh, no text field. So it's not necessarily that every document will have every field. Uh, some of the documents will have some field. And the fields which you want to always have, you can make it as required equal to true uh, in your schema. Do you need to have a unique one? Uh, ID? Yeah. Like, uh, like a primary key also. Yeah, so this unique key is actually kind of primary key. The only difference is that you, there are some cases you, where you can live without primary key also. But in most of the cases, you will need primary key, especially if you are having a distributed mm -hmm. environment and uh, for consistency or all, all those things, you will need primary key. And in all the production deployments, you will have some uh, primary key. Also, if you want to later update your documents, then you need to somehow know uh, which document to update, which doc to get to that document you need to update. It will still show you. So it's still showing me that uh, two documents. Can I search on some other Yeah, you can search on title field. So I will tell you why the, it might not be showing the result. It is because of the analyzer. First, um, let me sh show you. You have to give full things. You have to go give complete Apache Hadoop. Uh, yeah, I will tell you. So that is the next part, analyzer. So we will try to understand why for text field it was showing me result even when I was give, giving a single token but for this title field I have to give the complete thing. So uh, doesn't it show how many times that uh, word has come for searching open? Yeah. In that document, if we can have multiple open? In the same document, yeah. yeah. So There is a different component using that you can uh, find out uh, how many times a word has occurred in your index. Uh, but it will not show you for like for a particular document how many times that open has occurred. This you will not get in your search result. Yeah. 
the way you want you will do that so basically you are saying you want to have a term which you want to search on both title and text field and if, and if it matches in any of the field you want to display the result for that we use something called copy field uh, we will see that that is also in our by the way, title it works if you do a star. Yeah, but the normal way to star solar or something. But the normal way to do that is when you want to have uh, multiple field, you want to search on a field which consists of tokens from multiple fields. Uh, you use something called copy field. What if I provide a star between the field and the text? Just saying, just do this thing. No, you are saying we are. In the value you are saying or in the field name? In the field name. Oh, field name. Field name I will do such. Why did this not work? Because there is no field called star. We will see that. When we will see copy fields, we will see how we can query on uh, multiple fields. Yeah. So now comes the role of uh, data types. So notice that the data type of all the fields except this text en field was a string and that's why when we were searching on partial token then it was not giving me the results but for text en field uh, for uh, text field uh, we were ge getting the results even when uh, we were giving the uh, partial words so we will see the results for this but before that we will see what analyzers are and then it will make things more clear. Mm -hmm. So, how do you process the text? Whatever text that is getting inside the solar, before putting it in the inverter index, how do you process that? So, that we define through analyzers. So, suppose this is the raw text that you are getting, okay? This is a HTML document that you are indexing. So, you want to analyze this field. First thing you want to do is, before putting it into the index, first thing we will want to do is we will want to filter out few things which are uh, which doesn't constitute to the actual data like all this HTML tokens so uh, before data is put inside the inverted index it goes through analyzer and analyzer we can there are basically three type of analyzers first is the character filter what character filter does it it applies on every character so whatever is the so it treats the complete thing as a stream of characters and not every character whatever thing uh, whatever check you have defined uh, it will check for that and it will remove those try to remove those things um, then the second thing is tokenizer tokenizer breaks your document into terms so this is the document before uh, we have seen in the inverted index that it is a term to document mapping before putting it into the index we need to first break it into terms now how to break it into terms. Suppose there might be some words like uh, for an e-commerce site like Flipkart, for jeans there might be a term called Pepe jeans. So how to break this Pepe jeans? How will can you tell, tell Solar that instead of breaking Pepe jeans into two words, uh, don't break it into two words, put it as a single word. So basically how to break your input and raw text into tokens that you define through tokenizers. Then the third thing is token filters. Now when you have the tokens, which of the tokens you want to keep in your index and which of the tokens you want to remove from your index, that you specify through token filters. So just take an example of this HTML document. Uh, first we have defined a character filter called HTML. So these odd filters are available and by default there are a lot of filters available and you can also create your own filters and put it, plug it into Solar. So first filter we have defined is HTML script filter factory. It what it will do? It will go ahead and strip all the uh, HTML tokens like HTML body. So after going through this analyzer, uh, you will get this stream. This your raw text will get converted into this. This is a sample HTML document. Now you can specify multiple character filters for a input uh, string. You can try. You could have done other things also. You could have removed all the lowercase characters also. So once you have, once it goes through character filter, next thing you have to define is a tokenizer. What tokenizer will tell is how to break it into tokens. Uh, like I have defined a white space tokenizer for this. It will tell you that break my document based on the white space. Anytime it sees a white space, uh, it will try to break it into tokens. So 
tokenizer you can only specify one for a particular field because there is only one way you can break things in tokens um, there cannot be multiple ways to break uh, our text stream in tokens after you have tokens so these are the terms that will actually go into inverted index but before putting them into index what we will do is we will filter out unnecessary terms so that we can do using token filters we can use uh, like for example we can use this fil stop filter factory uh, which will remove all the stop words so a and the that all these things are like stop words uh, we can remove that plus you can give a list of plus you can give your own list of um, uh, tokens which you don't want to put into to uh, solar then there are other uh, token filters like pattern filters where you can specify a pattern suppose you are indexing credit card information then you can give a regex pattern to tell that don't index like 16 or 14 digit uh, numbers so finally we will get this document is converted into this many tokens sample html and document so this document is converted into three tokens and this will go inside the inverted index and there will be a mapping that document one cons uh, that sample token is present in document one HTML token is present in document one, and this document token is present in uh, document one. Now, here I have given a tokenizer at white space tokenizer. There is there are some cases where you don't want to tokenize things, like uh, if I have Pepe jeans, I don't want to tokenize it. Okay, so if I am put, putting a brand name, so if I have a brand name, I don't want to tokenize the brand name into multiple things. So in that case there is a tokenizer called keyword tokenizer what it does is it takes complete thing as indexes as a uh, single token so so when we are not putting in inverted index different tokens then obviously suppose instead of uh, using this white space tokenizer i would have used key, keyword space tokenizer right then instead of going as sample html document this would have went as complete thing sample html document as a single token so obviously when you don't have something in your uh, data structure and then when uh, then you have to search on complete thing you will get results only when you search for complete sample html document so this string type it doesn't tokenize the difference between string data type and text gen data type is that it doesn't tokenize a string doesn't tokenize your token whatever you are putting it it puts as a single token in, in case of pepe jeans don't you think people would still want to want a document pepe jeans if they search pepe initially or pepe jeans together yeah so again yeah, it depends on your case so if you so for that what we can do is again we can use a copy field one field we can use uh, for having the complete we can have same input set of that data but we can create two fields in solar one field will be of type string and so the data will go as non tokenized and another field we can have as text tn or some other tokenized type so when you are searching then you can search on that on the tokenized field and when you are doing other things like faceting uh, which we will cover later so then you can use the non tokenized field there are certain so it depends on case so my idea to explain here is you have control over uh, how you want to tokenize and what you want to tokenize if you want to tokenize something you can use uh, some different filter factories and there is a bunch of filter factories there is very good documentation available like what each token uh, what each tokenizer do yeah yeah Even the it's a lower case converter. It's been converted into smaller. Oh. Okay, okay. So lower case filter factory, it's converting all the upper case to the lower case. But how does it do? It opens again. Filter. So token filters basically tells you the transformation that you want to define before putting, finally putting the tokens into the inverted index. What all transformation you want to do on your tokens? So a stop filter factory filter is telling to remove stop words. Lower case filter factory is telling to convert upper all the characters into lower case. Stop 
filter is stop filter is removing the stop first like a and the and all those things so it basically token uh, before putting it into index what all transformation you want to do on your filter that you specify through token filter it's not that every to it's the token filter will remove stuff it will transform basically it might like this and this stop filter factory is an example uh, where it is removing the token but not every uh, filter will remove token there will be cases like for pattern grab and replace so it will search for suppose you wanted to convert this html to xml so you can specify a, a pattern match filter where you can match for all the html elements and convert that tokens into xml so this basically you can see as transformation phase yeah that is that is a predefined filter yeah Uh, just a question. Uh, like, so, uh, if I wanted to, so does the tokenizer uh, maintain the token order? I mean, so basically the question is if I'm. Yes, yes, it maintains. So, token order is very important. So, you are basically asking how sample token is related to document token, right? Yeah, if I'm trying to calculate an engram, so I can do that in the token filters. Yeah, you can use as engram token filters. So it depends on the order in which you have specified. So whenever you define any uh, analyzer, you first define the tokenizer. Okay. So first you can define the char character filter. It's not necessary that you always need to define character filter. First you can define character filter. Then you need to define tokenizer. And then in whatever order you define the filters, in the same order transformation will happen. So if this top filter factory you would have defined at the last, it will be applied at the last. Uh, no, text en is the default data type. It comes bundled with solar. So what it does is it, it basically. So whatever types we are we use in our schema, those types have to be defined in the um, schema dot xml itself. So you can see there is a definition for field type string. There is a definition for field type text en. So what we can do is we can have a look at. So for a field type, we have to define analyzer. So there, there can be two parts. First is the index part, and another is the query part. So here you can see that we can have separate index and query analyzer for a field type. Like what all transformation you want to do. Suppose while indexing the documents, you want to convert everything to lowercase. But while searching, you don't want everything to get converted into lowercase. So you can define different uh, tokenizer for index time and query time. So that was the reason why uh, search on that title field was not giving results when we were only searching for a uh, single token because it was a non-tokenized field. So we have to search for complete thing, then only it would uh, return result. Is there a way to set it up to treat quoted strings differently? Quoted? A quoted string. Yeah. Can you turn a filter on or off inside a quoted string? I don't exactly get it. Uh, what Supposing I want to turn everything to lowercase unless it's, unless it's inside a quoted string. Okay, okay. So, like that, can I turn off that lowercase filter? Mm, I'm not sure if there is any default filter exactly for this use case, uh, but it's very easy to implement this and you can uh, plug it. What you can do is you can just write a pattern matcher and accept double quotes. You can convert everything to lowercase. Yeah, but I don't want to do it only for lowercase. I want to do it for every factory I have and I want to treat quoted strings differently. Um, I say on off kind of thing. I'm not sure. I don't know if okay. there is any filter. There might be. There is a whole bunch of filters. If I can show it to you. So, can you extend an existing filter? Yeah, yeah, you can extend. So then, but I don't yeah. want to do it. Yeah, yeah, I want to write a bunch of code. I just want to plan. Yeah, so there is a list of all the tokenizer labels. So you can go through this list and see if there is anything. Yeah, I guess there is no default return. But yeah, sorry. Yeah, so I mentioned character filters apply on per character basis. 
token filters this can add change or remove token basically transform the tokens and this is the link where you can get list of all the tokenizers and, and default tokenizer and analyzer then the other thing is the dynamic fields so till now we have seen that uh, we have to uh, predefine the field whatever field we are indexing through our document we have to predefine those fields in our document so there is something called dynamic fields using which you need not know the name of the fields uh, beforehand so you can say anything ending with at uh, ending with underscore i that would be of type int and that would be indexed and stored so using this you can i mean it add dynamic uh, functionality to your schema you need not have everything defined all the field definitions defined in your schema so suppose if you are having some analytics application and you want you know that all my columns which are ending with something x y z those are those belong to this particular class then you can define a dynamic field for that class and suppose if i enter abc underscore i then it would uh, get matched by this dynamic field definition and it would be stored as an int when you are searching for that field you can go ahead and use the original name whatever you have defined while indexing like abc underscore i so name is a regular expression or it just exists uh, while indexing yeah in the in that schema definition mm -hmm. you have to give it as a regex a star only star or it accepts other like no no it only accepts a star whatever it's or yeah. anything specific like abc underscore i yeah anything after a star you can <coughs> give basically next thing is uh, copy field so uh, there are some cases where you want to have multiple versions of the same field so you are indexing some documents but you want to have different version you want to have one thing which suppose i am indexing a document uh, which has title in it but i want one field which has title in upper case and i want one field which has title in a lower case what i can you do is i can index that field only once and then create a copy field multiple copies of that field so suppose and put it inside some fields so suppose i want to have a master field and um, a master search field and that has that has that need to have tokens for uh, all the fields so i can use copy field functionality here i can specify like this so i have a destination field called text and this is my master search field it will have tokens from all the fields so what i will do is um, i will define source as uh, this is the category uh, just a normal field and destination is whatever is the, my master field so what will happen is tokens from cat name menu features includes all these tokens will go inside text field so when i will go ahead and search uh, on this text field even though that token is present in any of these fields uh, it will give me the results then there are certain uh, parameters which we can define uh, while defining our schema so one is index other thing is stored so what index means is uh, index says that put this thing into inverted index whenever you are searching what it is doing it is going into the inverted index it is looking for a term and it's giving you the list of documents which have that term so index equal to true means index that thing into in inverted index so that user can search on it so index equal to true make things searchable if you don't want to search on particular field you just want to store it and later display it to user for that case we do store equal to true so store equal to true tells that i don't want to search on this field i don't want oh, i only want to uh, store data in it so that is where people abuse this thing so even though they don't want uh, many things uh, to be searchable but then also they try to use solar as a new no sql store and they make everything store true it increases your data structure very much and it affects the performance so even though it's there but uh, i mean use it wisely anything you can move outside uh, move outside don't make everything is stored equal to true solar is for searching not storing things so do you think that uh, anything which has uh, you can interpret a field as an integer or a string right yeah does an integer have better performance yeah it completely depends so there are certain uh, your performance of a data types depend on per your queries type of queries you want to do suppose you are doing lot of range queries on some field 
So there are some tri based data types, T int, T long. So range queries will be much faster using those data types. So your data type definition has to be completely based on your query. So yeah. So anything which I have defined is told equal to false will not show up in my uh, document. So even though I can go ahead and search on it, but when I retrieve the results, it will not uh, show me. Then other uh, field parameter is multi-value. Uh, if you want to store an array of values, then you can set multi-value equal to true. Then other thing is doc values. Uh, there are certain use cases like sorting of results. So when doc values, what doc values does it? It, it by default, so Solar app keeps everything, all these mappings in the heap. So if you have very large data set, and if you want to do things like sorting and all those things, if you want to move things out of heap, then you can set doc values equal to true. Then what Solar will do? It will kind of uh, create an uninverted index for those things and keep it on disk. Then other thing is omit norms. So there is thing called normalization. So Suppose you have one small document and one very large document and if a term is occurring in the small document one time and same term is occurring on the large document say 10 times then you can exactly say that what is the weight of that term. So um, what omit not does it, it keeps a normalized weight of that term So uh, for that field. So if a document is very large and that term has occurred only once then the weight of that term will be small because the normalized score of that term will be small. So if you want to normal, do normalization, normalize, keep normalized score on a field, then you can set omit norms. Otherwise, you can ignore this uh, because it takes a bunch of memory. Then there are a few cases for which you have to enable term vectors and positions. It, it keeps <coughs> like, if you, uh, it keeps a mapping like what is the distance between this term to this term. There are certain cases where you need that. In those cases, you can keep these things uh, on or off. So all these are field par parameters, and you can define this uh, in your schema. So what we can quickly uh, do now is uh, we can just create our own custom data type, and we can index some documents from Stack Exchange, and we will see how we can uh, analyze those uh, data types from the admin file. If you'll go into readme of activity two, there is a schema.xml. So we need to copy this schema and we need to copy this schema and copy it over to the collection one of our minimal folder. So what this schema has, this schema has a couple of field definitions that is suited for stack exchange data, like we have date creation date, what is the site and what is the post type question or answer, all these things uh, we have created. So what you can do is <coughs> copy this file and replace it with the original collection. So what we did just now is we changed the configuration of collection one. If you will go in the admin UI and if you will go to select this collection one. Yeah, you have to reload the code. First, uh, let me show. So, if you go to this collection one and schema browser, then you will see all the fields which are available for that schema. So, right now, I'm not able to see any of the new fields because I have changed my configuration. So, what I need to do is I need to uh, either I can restart Solar or I can just reload it, reload particular code uh, from 
admin UI itself. <coughs> so just go to core admin, select collection one, and just hit reload. So it will reload the code. Now if I go to schema browser, I will see all the uh, new fields. Is everyone able to uh, update the schema? Very mm -hmm. well, copying it to not go beyond query. Mm -hmm. We are doing everything inside example minimal solar collection one folder. Well, can you look at what it looks like? Um, okay. What looks like schema? The schema browser. Okay. You can select the schema browser. Oh, schema browser you are not able to see? Uh, just do the full screen. Your resolution might be low actually. So if resolution is low, then the things get hidden like this. You can enter a schema browser from the URL itself. If you are not able to see, just enter a schema browser, icon browser over here. Any questions so far? So what I will do now is, um, I have changed the configuration, I still have three documents which I have indexed earlier, now I will try to index some new documents. So right now if I try to retrieve uh, documents, you will see the older documents, existing documents. And if the schema has changed to a certain extent where the earlier index fields are not there, then is that, I mean that would be an error. Then it will throw up errors, yeah. even though it will have those tokens somewhere in your inverted index. Yeah. It will throw error before even going to that data section. That's why it will throw error. So what people basically do is whenever you change the schema very much, then they re-index all the documents. So if you will refer read me of activity two. Now we will try to index one sample document from the Stack Exchange website. So just change to this directory. So this is what the document looks like. Now note that there is now no text or title field over here. I will again use the same post utility. So the new file has been indexed using these fields, but the old ones seem to be uh, using the old schema. Yeah. yeah. That's so it's, it's like that. So, yeah. Even though you won't be able to search those things, but those things will be there in your uh, data directory. I can pause the. Hmm? So how do we? Yeah. So the way people do is they re-index the complete thing. We re-index. So right now I'm not re-indexing uh, things. I'm keeping old stuff as it is. So I'm showing this example that you can have like dynamic schema. Whenever this level of schema changes there, we either we beforehand predict that our schema will change and we keep our data types like uh, based on that. Otherwise, we re-index completely. So I have indexed this thing. Now if I'll go and you will see that it is showing me now four documents. What you can do is, if you just want to delete those things, uh, you can use this uh, delete query and it will. 
So it will delete all the documents. So now now found is zero. Now you can do a fresh uh, insert. So the delete query is also mentioned in the readme file. Query to delete all the documents. So now if I did a star query, you can see that there is only one document in text. Um, I will quickly show you how you can use the um, uh, field analysis browser. So there is an analysis component and here in analysis component you can go ahead and uh, see what your data will look like after being indexed. So let us say I have this comment, I can enter whatever token I have, I can click on analyze value and it will show you what all things it will do and what all stage. So basically you can use this UI to analyze. For example, I have this custom data type. What I am doing through this custom data type is, I am um, first storing everything as a single token, then I am replacing all the four digits into a star. Okay? So I can add this custom data type into my schema definition. <coughs> So I have created a new data type, my custom type and in this custom type I am replacing all the four digits with a star. So I can, after making this change I can reload or restart solar. So in my custom type, if I give anything like some data plus if I give <coughs> four character digits, okay. So let me explain this a little. I have defined a custom data type. I have defined three things here. First, I have defined a tokenizer called keyword tokenizer. Then there are uh, two filter filters. In the analysis UI, you can see what is the stage after each of these things. So when this thing goes into this keyword tokenizer, what I get? Then after this lowercase filter, what I get? Suppose one of thing I can convert it to. So you can see that in the lowercase filter, it is converting this SAS to lowercase. And the final is the pattern replace filter. In pattern replace filter, I have told it to replace all the four digits to star and it's doing that. So that way you can change multiple filters and create your own data types. It shows all the stages of your date field type. And this was for this was for um, index time. You can do the same thing for query time also. If you enter a thing for it will basically show both query and index time analysis. So using this, you can uh, tune your data types to uh, match your needs. Uh, then there is a schemaless mode, um, and it's actually not useful at all uh, when you are going into production because you can see that the performance of Solar depends uh, hugely on how you define your data types. So in a schemaless mode, what it do is it tries to detect the type, it tries to detect the date integers and create a schema by itself. 
but sometimes it don't it is not as much efficient as it should be and that's why uh, it's not at all used in production it's just there for namesake so we can take a quick uh, tea break then we can uh, see how we can index document using solar chip Shall we take a break or shall we go ahead? <laughs> so whenever you index some data, uh, it goes to some request handlers. And there are some predefined request handlers available. Uh, like there is a update request handler, uh, which will take the document and uh, index it. Uh, you can also define your request handler if you want to do some other pre-processing before indexing. Uh, one thing in solar is if you are if you have indexed one document using some id and if you are again using the same id and re-indexing that what it will do is it will delete the previous one and it will index the new one what happens in rdbms is if you are indexing using the same priority it throws up error so in, in in solar update actually means delete and override so whenever you are indexing something it's basically delete the old id and index the new thing now, if you want to only update parts of the document, then there is something called atomic updates. What you can do is, uh, instead of updating the whole document, uh, you can update some particular fields. So right now there are three things available, set, add and increment. Uh, if you want to change the value for some field, uh, you can uh, use set. If you want to add a new value to a multi-valued field, you can use add. And if you want to increment value of a certain field, you can use increment. So it is there, it's a bit slow uh, than normal indexing, uh, but uh, it's there. You need not uh, update the whole document always. So there are clients available for solar in lot of languages. Um, most uh, commonly used is the Java one, because it always uh, keep itself updated with the uh, solar versions. Whenever they release a new solar version, they always package the equivalent solar J uh, client with it. So, uh, and also solar J is the uh, only one which provides uh, a cloud server client. So, it takes care of it takes care of distributing your request both at query time and indexing time. Uh, on other clients, what you have to do is you have to put your own load load balancing on top of uh, your cluster. So if you will open Eclipse, then there is a project called Solar Demo. Inside that, inside Solar Demo, there is a package called Concert Solar J. There is an example, indexer example. So how you can connect to solar is uh, basically to connect to solar you need to create a uh, uh, you need to create an instance of HTTP solar server and provide it the link of the uh, whatever collection you want to connect to. So I have specified collection as collection one. Uh, ignore this bookkeeper host for now. And my solar is running at uh, 8983 port, so I have specified localhost 8983. So I. Just out of curiosity, so uh, you are, uh, this is probably for uh, installing solar in distributed way, so when you are doing it, so do you, we, do we need to install the Zookeeper separately or it uh, comes as part of solar? It comes with, uh, Zookeeper comes bundled with solar package, uh, but as I mentioned Zookeeper, but it's very unstable. So what you need to do is, you have to set up your own Zookeeper <coughs> separately, your own quota and then uh, you can uh, point it, you can give, while creating this uh, instance, you just need to give the uh, Zookeeper port code list. Yeah. So this example is for a single node. So whenever <coughs> you are running on a single node, then you have to use this HTTP solar server. And when you are in cloud mode, I mean distributed mode, when you have multiple uh, uh, solar instances running, then you have to use this cloud solar server client. What it does is, uh, and you will notice here that uh, while connecting over here, we have to give the uh, exact IP and exact port. While connect, while using Solar Cloud in, uh, while using Solar J in cloud mode, uh, we just need to give the Zookeeper uh, IP. We we will talk about this when we will talk about Zookeeper. So after you create a um, uh, HTTP Solar Server instance.
uh, what you can do is either you can index document one by one or you can index document in bulk. So if you want to index document, basically you need to create a solar input document and you need to just add it, uh, just send, call the add on the server basically. So here what I am doing is, I am trying to index uh, multiple documents in bulk. So okay. that also you can do and if you want to index, uh, indexing in bulk obviously improve, improves the performance. Uh, so it's always advisable to get a sweet spot of how many documents you want to uh, send in one bulk and uh, index documents in bulk. So if I'll run it, it is picking some documents from uh, sample data activity three and docs folder, and it is just trying to index those documents. So it's very straightforward. There's uh, no thrill over here. So it has. Added document zero. So now same thing. When you are using cloud indexer, then you will notice everything else remains same. Uh, we just need to create one solar input document. So here what we did? We just created a solar input document and we just specified the field and its value. So same thing you have to do when you are using in cloud mode also. You just need to create document in the same way. The only difference is instead of using HTTP solar server, uh, you just need to use the cloud <coughs> solar server. So there are clients available in other language also if you want to use. So whenever you index something, uh, first of all, it goes into a transaction log. And from transaction log, when you call commit, so you can call. So here you will see that I am calling commit. Unless and until I don't call commit, it don't get written to the uh, actual index. Uh, we can define this commit duration in the configuration file also. But basically, whenever you index something, it first gets written to a transaction log, and from that transaction log, uh, whenever we later call commit, it gets written to the actual index. Uh, there are two type of commits. Uh, one is hard commit and another is soft commit. Uh, the way solar is stored the data is, uh, it creates multiple inverter index and later try to merge those index. So whenever you are indexing new data, it will create a new index for those data. And later when you call optimize, there is a thing called optimize, it will try to merge those segments. So if you want near real time updates, okay. If you want uh, as soon as data is indexed, you want the users to see those things. Then you will only go with soft commit. What soft commit do is it will just try to transaction log, and whatever you are uh, reading, you can get those results from uh, transaction log itself. Uh, but the downside of this is uh, if you don't call commit and if it don't get written to the actual index, uh, if your solar crashes, then whatever is inside the transaction log. Uh, it might get uh, corrupted and you want to you will lose that thing. so it's always uh, good to index in um, batch to i mean save on the network okay now the part is uh, data import handler uh, right now we have seen that we have we are indexing using the flat files and using flat xmls what you can do is instead of using the flat files, you can directly use other data sources like uh, most common use cases, indexing documents from your database itself. So you can use data import handlers and you can define your configuration uh, to directly import data from database to um, uh, solar. So we will try this activity. So what we will do, we will first uh, load some data into uh, MySQL. If you'll go in readme of activity 4, uh, first what we need to do is uh, we need to create a database.
So inside this activity 4, there is a uh, SQL DDL. Here we are trading three tables. First table is to store the comments. So whenever user post, uh, whenever we have some post on Stack Overflow, there are some comments. So we are creating three tables. First table is to store the comments. Another table is to store to store the actual post. The third table is to create the uh, user ID and name. So what we will do using these three tables, we will first insert data in these three tables uh, from the Stack Exchange dumps. And then from the MySQL, we will index that data directly into the Sora. So first you need to start MySQL. You can use this uh, command to start the MySQL. After that, you can go to this uh, activity 4 folder. There you will find this MySQL schema file. You can create database and tables using uh, So what this did was it created our database and it created three tables, comments, user and post to store the data. Now we have inside the sample data folder, we have uh, this folder called stack exchange data. Uh, right now it has data for two of the sites, robotics and Windows Phone. We will try to index, uh, we will first index and insert data of robotics of site into MySQL. So if you go to this stack, stack exchange loader or Java, you, know, you can use this utility to insert data into MySQL. So it is reading data from the flat stack exchange term and inserting into MySQL. But why would you want to do that? So we are going to see an example how to import data directly from MySQL to Solar without creating this flat files or other things. So this is basically what data import handler is. In data import handler, you just need a source and you just need to have a schema. It will directly import data from source. And source can be any other thing also, any uh, stream, uh, HTTP stream or anything else. Actual data is present inside uh, sample data slash stack exchange data. Then in, in solar, what is it in Eclipse? Yeah, so it's just a utility to read data from that file and insert it into MySQL. So whatever list we are giving over here, it's reading from that uh, sample data folder and it's just uh, inserting that data into MySQL. So we have loaded data in MySQL. Now what we need to do is uh, we need to uh, define a configuration like how we how we will import this data. If you will go in and see the table definitions, then you can see uh, that comments table has uh, this column, post table has this column, and user table has ID and display name. Now there are three tables, but in Solar, uh, this document goes as a single document. So we need to define some mapping, you, like select from this, we have this and this. So this type of mapping you have to define in some config file. So inside this activity 4 folder, you will see the uh, config file. 
So here in this config file, what I am defining is, I am first defining the uh, data source, uh, where from where my data will come from. So I have defined this thing, uh, the MySQL username and password. Now to create the document, I have to define the mappings. So I am saying that select this from post table in MySQL. This query will be executed on uh, MySQL and when this query is executed, I will get all these columns. Now I will I need to map those col columns to the equivalent solar columns like side column. This side column is coming from post table in my SQL. Now when going into solar, this will go as st underscore side. Same thing for comments. So uh, as I mentioned that there will be only single documents. So what we need to do is uh, we need to define uh, we can define multiple nested queries also. So after selecting this ID from post table what I can do is I can get the uh, comments for that ID from the comments table. So you can define multiple nested table of queries also uh, using this way. So here I am reading data from MySQL. I am defining the mapping that side column from MySQL how it should go into uh, solar. While going into solar it will be converted to ST underscore site. Then I am selecting from other tables also and finally I am putting it uh, into uh, solar. So once I have this config file ready, I just need to place this config file inside the solar con folder. So this type of configuration for data import, this type of configuration we need to do in uh, solar config.xml. So this has to be done for every collection. This is done per collection. So for collection one, inside con folder and solar config, uh, we can add this request handler. And what I am saying in this request handler is, um, I am creating a request handler called data import. And whatever configuration I want, uh, whatever configuration I have mentioned, uh, that location of that file I can mention in inside this whole thing, inside config field, that where it should read the configuration from. So once I copy that file inside con folder and I add this data import in solar config. Uh, if I go in admin UI and I click on data import, I will see the exact same configuration file over here. So this is telling uh, solar how to import the data from MySQL. Now I can directly just execute this thing. So it's reading records from MySQL and directly indexing into uh, solar. So this same thing can be, we can do for other sources also we can do for streams. So we need not uh, worry about putting the things uh, over some raw file system or anything like that. Yeah, Hadoop integration. There, yeah, there is a certain component for altogether different component for Hadoop, uh, where you can read and write your index uh, to Hadoop. But the thing is, uh, the reason why Hadoop and Solar has not yet gone that much in mainstream is uh, the reasons for which you use Hadoop. Uh, all of those features are most of those features are already provided to you uh, by Solar Cloud. All the replication and all the distributed uh, features. So that is why. Yeah, yeah. In that case, yeah, you can do. If you, yeah, yeah, you can import. Yeah, you can import. So while importing, you can also define your script transformers. I mean, you can specify, create your own functions, uh, which will be applied to your data before putting it into Solar. So script transformers also you can define. You can define this into multiple languages, JavaScript, Ruby, all those languages you can define. Uh, now I will quickly come to the query part and quickly finish this and come to Solar Cloud. Uh, there are all sorts of uh, queries that you can do on Solar. Um, Solar provides a lot of different query parsers. Um, different query parsers have different um, 
set of features like some of the query parsers they are better if you want to do boosting and all those things um, you can uh, you can define the query parser in solar config like which query parser to use or you can use that query time itself in the uh, uh, browser <coughs> so there are different type of queries you can do you can do simple text search where you can just search for one keyword you can change number of rows number of records which are retrieved you can have pagination you can tell uh, when you want pagination facility you can have the start parameter it will tell uh, where to uh, take this and uh, you can search on some specific fields so you can tell if you only want to search on a specific field you can say that okay a uh, field colon value then while searching you will notice that whenever we search for something okay here data import header you will see that it has finished um, if not i will go and see the records it is not showing okay. so it has created like 2000 uh, documents from my sql so whenever we query anything from solar uh, you will see that it return me all the fields for the document i can limit those things by specifying the field list uh, suppose i only want i am only interested in getting the uh, uh, title field so i can specify that field and then i will only get uh, that field whenever you ask for any field then it has to go on disk and fetch those fields so unless and until you don't need all the fields it's always better to uh, specify what exact fields you need there is delete query uh, you can have and to search uh, and or boolean level queries you can have you can have not queries uh, you can sort the results based on some uh, query so so suppose we have we want to sort the results based on uh, the score of that question how many score how many favorites uh, likes uh, that question has got so we can sort it in ascending or descending order so it will give you the highest if it will give you document which have higher score first you can change the order of, of sorting from descending to ascending uh, the next thing is facetting so this is a very useful thing uh, like uh, let's say let's say you are interested to know that uh, how many uh, how many documents have username equal to uh, triple h say okay so this is called facetting facetting gives you for every field how many documents have uh, what number of unique values so for that you can uh, use the facet query Uh, facet query will return for every field whatever field list you will give it will return you the set of unique values plus the count of uh, unique value uh, plus the count of documents for each unique value <coughs> so, like i have 2000 documents okay so for 2000 documents there will be multiple values for this st size field if i do faceting then i will get unique values present in st site and along with unique values i will also get the number of documents which have that particular value so faceting you can have and you can change the facet method so while doing faceting if the number of unique values for a field are very low uh, then you can change it to facet method equal to enum you know, uh, that is much better in performance and uh, then you can have a stats query so a stats query will give you all kinds of stats on a particular field Uh, if you are dealing with an analytics <coughs> application, then this might be of use. It will give you the max min values for uh, that field and all other things. Then you can do a facet range query. So if you will see in this example, so I am building this chart where I am showing how many documents are present for year 2012. So basically, I am asking Solar to give me aggregated count of documents over a uh, range of date. so 
this is called this can be done achieved through passive range queries the syntax is uh, sorry i'm rushing through this uh, I, uh, I mean these are examples you can uh, take reference from slides and uh, try it at home then you can have range queries um, you can specify the range that okay the value of this should be between this and then you can do a boosting on a field suppose you want to uh, return results from a query but you want to boost result which have value equal to questions you want to see the results but at the same time you want to boost the results which are of type questions and you want to keep questions higher in your result set and answers in lower in your result set. So what you can do is you can use a boost query. And here I am saying is uh, uh, BQ equal to ST post type colon question. So I am asking Solar to boost values of values which have question in it by a factor of five. So boost query you can use in all different ways to influence your result set. Then there is fuzzy search. Uh, for this search is uh, for approximate matching. Suppose you have multiple type of uh, words in your documents like ele electromagnetism, electromagnetic, electromagnets and whenever users search for electromagnet, you want him to give results for all those things. Uh, so in that case you can have fuzzy search and you can specify a fuzziness factor that okay it should be between 1 and 0 and 1. Uh, the more it nears to 1 it is uh, less fuzzy. So if it, it will, if you specify like this, then it will give you results which match electromagnetic and electromagnetism also. So if it's a low fuzzy count, is it still matching electromagnet or will it be fuzzy with the T and the E also? <coughs> if it's low, then it's more strict. It's more strict. Fuzziness so factor, yeah, so this fuzziness factor, how fuzzy it can be. So why is, what's the difference between, so earlier we saw something like electromagnet, this star. So that is equivalent to maximum fuzziness, right? Yeah, electromagnetic star is everything. Match electromagnet plus anything fuzzy. after electromagnet. So less fuzzy is what? So less fuzzy will also match electromag MAGN. Okay. It has to do with the edit distance between the words. Yeah. It's not necessarily it will be electromagnetic. It doesn't, so that much doesn't have to match. It's a edit distance. Mm -hmm. Within a token distance between the uh, uh, characters. Distance between words is this proximity search. <coughs> So suppose you want to match documents, okay? Uh, which suppose in uh, that in your result set you have something like co calculating some coordinates. Now if you search for calculating coordinates, then it will not match those things. But you can specify a proximity factor that okay, even if the distance between coordinating and calculating words it's two, uh, still uh, match those things. So you can give the proximity level between two tokens using uh, proximity search. Uh, then there are function queries, uh, you can have all sort of function queries plus uh, function queries, you can write your own function queries to uh, operate on whatever values you have. There is term and group queries, you have for grouping, it's a basic use case. Uh, more like this, so more like this feature you can use to uh, get the count of, to get documents which are matching to a certain document. You can give ID of some document and then ask for solar that give me documents which are more like this. So this you can do using more like this component. Is this closely related to clustering? No. Is this anywhere related to clustering? No, no, it's not related to clustering at all. In clustering, in clustering what you try to do is, uh, in clustering what you try to do is you have some documents and out of those documents you try to create clusters of your own. Okay, you try to define uh, words of your own and then assign each document to one or more of the clusters. Here you are just searching for terms in that document and whatever is the maximum, uh, whatever document matches maximum of the terms, you return those things. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, so the text inside uh, Solus, it is already been processed <coughs> using uh, tokenizers, etc. Yeah. So this externally supplied text, can we also make them go through those things and um, how does it happen? Externally supplied text means? So more like this handler, request handler with external. Yeah, so here I am giving just an ID. So I am giving ID. So it will get tokens for this document. Document with ID robotics underscore one. Okay, it will get terms for that. And it will try to, uh, based on those terms, it will try to find matching documents. Now, uh, this part is clustering. So in clustering, what it is doing is, 
I search for data. I got this documents. Now, out of these documents, it will try to create some uh, clusters and then assign each document to one or more of this cluster. So this is the clustering component and this it, uh, takes from the uh, uh, caret actually. So there are a lot of configuration options for clustering. Mm -hmm. Autocomplete, uh, I don't think we have time for this. So actually it's very well documented in the activities. Um, I will show it. So let's say I first search for data. It gave me results, all well and good. But suppose I misspelled the word, okay, and I instead I type D E T A instead of data. So what this spell check component can do is um, it can provide you suggestions like instead of D E T A, uh, what user was actually trying to say, and then it will provide you collation also. So it will tell you that if it would have been data then there were 250 hits. If it would have been data, then there were 23 hits. So you can use this to, I mean, auto correct the user queries. Suppose he searched for something. Uh, how people mostly do this is, uh, they always keep this spell check on, and they see that how many documents are found, and then they go ahead and uh, do some, uh, perform some analysis on whatever results they are getting from the coalition. Okay, suppose, uh, when I search for data, I got one result and this coalition is suggesting me for some other term, it suggests to me uh, like 1000 matches. Then I can show somewhere in the UI, did you mean like this. So you can use this uh, to build uh, did you mean kind of uh, functionality. Also you can use this to uh, auto complete user queries. So I have mentioned over here how to configure this, it's just a matter of configuration. You have to specify some field. Uh, which field you want to use uh, for autocomplete, it will take tokens from that field and it will uh, do a spell check and suggestions from that field. So this, uh, this is the um, spell check component and similarly you same uh, functionality you can use for um, autocomplete you can give uh, some query, give some term, and it will show you suggestions uh, for that term. You can also have uh, matching phrases. You can configure it to give you complete phrases. Like if you give for some, then it will give you a complete phrase instead of terms. It's uh, very straightforward. Yeah, so the most important part now is the solar cloud. Um, so actually the reason solar is popular is only because of solar cloud and the way it provides a distributed search. Otherwise it had, would have been very, it, you know, before that it was very difficult to build uh, scalable and distributed search applications. Um, so uh, let's try to understand what was, the, what was the need of solar cloud. Earlier we used to have only a single index on single machine. So first of all the problem was uh, whenever you are indexing some things then complete thing has to go on a single collection and that was uh, that improves and that affects query time very much. So whenever you are indexing something then your index is continuously changing. You are querying again on the same thing then obviously the performance was very low. Second thing was when you have everything at the single place and it goes down, there is no um, fault tolerance. So Solar Cloud solve all those things. Um, it provides performance, performance by splitting your data. It splits your data into multiple portions, uh, which are called shards. And you only query some of the shards and not all shards always. Uh, it provides scalability. Um, you can have multiple shards on same machine, or you can have multiple shards on different machines and all the communication is done through Zookeeper. Um, it's high available. You can have multiple copies of same data. Uh, so if one copy goes down, then you will have a different copy for that data. 
uh, it's very simple. There is, it's completely abstracted. And while querying and <coughs> indexing, you have seen in SolarJet that uh, there is no need to change anything apart from just changing uh, your server client. So this is uh, what a high-level server cloud setup will look like. By default, when we, when you are using a single instance solar, then there is only machine one. There is only one instance of solar running. And inside that instance, there will be multiple collections, but each of them will have only uh, one shard. So what solar cloud did it? Now we can have the same collection. Let's consider this example collection two. What it will do is it will ha we can have our collection is split across multiple machines and on multiple machines we can run multiple instances of solar and some of the machines will have some portion of the data plus we can make copies of uh, that data um, and all the communication uh, when running in solar cloud is done through zookeeper so what zookeeper does is actually uh, first of all we start a zookeeper cluster what Zookeeper do is it keeps the shared resources. So all this right now you have seen that we are keeping all the configuration inside this collection one directory itself. So that is not a good way to do it. So what Zookeeper does is we can put all the configuration in Zookeeper, and then whenever we want to create a new collection, we can use the same configuration from the Zookeeper and create the collection. So there will be a cluster of Zookeeper. Zookeeper will help communication between multiple shards uh, on multiple machines. So Zookeeper is not specific to solar, uh, it's a standalone project, it's used in Hadoop ecosystem and uh, it provides a lot of um, distributed communication facilities. Uh, on solar side, we use Zookeeper for two things. First is for communication between uh, uh, solar nodes on different machines and keeping the uh, shared resources. So, uh, okay, so a portion of data when in solar cloud we call it uh, as shard. So, what I can do is I can quickly uh, bring up a cluster. Uh, you guys want to try on this exercise? Bringing up a cluster? Yeah, we can do this. So, first thing we can do is uh, we have to start a uh, Zookeeper node. So if you go, uh, let's open the activity. Uh, what's the name? Six. So what we will do now is we will start a zookeeper node. We will start two solar nodes. We will then uh, create a distributed collection, and then we will index some documents into that collection and see how that goes. So first thing is we have to start Zookeeper. So just uh, go to the Zookeeper folder. So Zookeeper uses a configuration file uh, to locate uh, which all uh, machines are there in that quorum. But since we are starting only a single node cluster, so single node Zookeeper cluster, so what we can do is we can just uh, leave it to default. So default data directory is varlib Zookeeper. It will, Zookeeper will store its own data and shared resources in this directory. And by default, it will run on 2181 port. So just uh, run this command, zookeeper start, it will start a zookeeper node. <coughs> it will start zookeeper in the background, so if you can just then after starting, you can go and click on Zookeeper status. So it will show you 
status. So it's showing more than standalone. So now, uh, once we have Zookeeper up, uh, Zookeeper, and you guys have started. Okay, now we have Zookeeper up. So now what we will do is we will create two instance of two solar instance. So as I mentioned earlier, that example actually example folder is actually a server folder. So we will make two copies of this example folder and we will fire up solar on both of these copies. So I have, I have created two copies of example folder. Now if you will go inside solar folder of both of these uh, copies, then you will see that you still have this collection one. First thing I have to do is, I have to remove this collection one from here and put it as a shared resource in Zookeeper. So I will remove uh, the collection one from both of these uh, nodes. After removing collection one from both of these nodes, now I will start my solar and point it to Zookeeper. So that in that way, uh, I will start solar in cloud mode. So starting solar cloud is nothing uh, but giving the port of Zookeeper, it will automatically understand that we are trying to understand it, uh, it started in cloud mode and it will uh, take care of all the communications. So now what we need to do is, since we are starting two nodes on the same machine, uh, we have to change the port, we need to change port of uh, both the machines. So for first instance, give port 2001. So this configuration djt.port, it will change the port. Then other configuration is dck host equal to localhost 2181. So what we are giving here is, what we can give through zk host is a comma separated list of zookeeper, uh, class, zookeeper nodes. So we are running a single uh, node zookeeper on our local, so we'll give as localhost 2181. Then other configuration is bootstrap conf equal to false. Uh, what it is telling is uh, that I don't want to upload any upload some default configuration to zookeeper. Otherwise, what you can do is you can specify some uh, default collection which will be uploaded to zookeeper. So we don't want to upload any default thing to zookeeper, so give as false and then do uh, starter job. Uh, this command I am just directly copy pasting from uh, this wiki.txt. So you will see over here that um, client is connected to Zookeeper and it has updated the cluster state from Zookeeper. Now if you will go to browser, uh, whenever you start solar by providing the Zookeeper host, it will add an additional tab over here called cloud. This cloud will show you data from Zookeeper. So right now, you will see as uh, if you will go inside cloud and then pre-tab, then it will show you a list of live nodes. Uh, so right now there is only one live node running on 200 port one. So 
let's start one more note. And we will start this node on 200 port. Uh, remaining command will be same, only we will change we will change the jetty dot port. This command also I'm exactly copy pasting from readme. Now, if I'll go in tree view and I will see the list of live nodes, it will show me uh, two live nodes. So now I have two solar running, two solar nodes running, uh, one zookeeper running. Now what we need to do is we need to uh, upload some configuration uh, which will be used for creating a collection. <coughs> So again, I will refer the readme. So uploading a config set to Zookeeper. So instead of calling it a configuration, we call it a config set because it has uh, multiple uh, configuration files. So Solar provides some default cloud scripts to upload uh, things to Zookeeper, uh, but it's completely Solar independent what you put inside Zookeeper. But you can uh, use the scripts uh, come, which comes bundled with Solar to upload things to Zookeeper. So if you will go inside solar 481 and cloud scripts folder, you will see some scripts. <coughs> so I am here inside node 1 scripts and cloud script folder and it is showing me that I have this CKCLI uh, script. I can use this to upload config set to solar. Uh, config set is nothing, it has a bunch of configuration, same configuration files uh, which we had uh, for the same collection one. So what I am telling over here is, I am telling this script to upload config to Zookeeper at this port and I want to upload this directory and I want to name this config set as collection1. So, command of config, zookeeper. So, what folks normally do is uh, instead of running a single zookeeper, we have uh, uh, we have you know quorum and cluster of zookeeper running so that if one zookeeper fails, because you can see over here that all the communications will happen through zookeeper, all the node discovery and everything happens through zookeeper. So, if one zookeeper goes down, then it will completely fail our cluster. So we have multiple zookeepers running and then multiple uh, solar nodes running and then they talk to each other. So I am uploading this config set by the name of collection1. It has uploaded successfully. Now again if I go into tree view, I can go into tree view by clicking on cloud then tree it will show me a new uh, folder called configs. Inside config, I can see the name of the config set which I have just uploaded. Inside this config set, you will see all the configuration files. You can see over here it's schema and over here it's uh, our solar config and all the additional stuff that comes uh, prepackaged. Okay, so now we have two solar nodes, one zookeeper, one config set. Now we can use this config set and create a collection. Uh, while creating a collection, now in solar cloud, I have the power to tell how many partitions of the data I will uh, I will need. Okay, so I can tell how many shards I need. Additionally, I can tell how many copies of each shard I will need. So I can tell the replication factor. Plus, I can tell how many shards I want on a single node. So, I can specify number of shards on a single node. So, let's see how we can, uh, what's the API to do that. So, so, Solar provides collections API 
for dealing with all the operations using uh, for this creating collection, creating shards, replicas, splitting a shard into multiple parts, then creating copies of shards, moving shards over here. Yeah. There's a whole bunch of collection APIs for everything. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I wanted to show. This is the command to create the collection. What it's saying is. Uh, I'm saying that I want to use admin collections API. I'm saying action is equal to create collection. Name of collection should be collection one. Number of shards should be two. So it means that I will break my data into uh, two parts. Then the replication factor is I can change it to two. That means I want two copies um, on each uh, for each shard. Then I can uh, then I have to provide the config set. Uh, which will be used to create the collection. I have just uploaded a config set by the name of collection one. I can give that collection dot config name. And that port, that port should be port should one of the new ones. Yeah. Yeah. Plus one more thing. So you will see that I am saying Solar that create two shards and two replicas. Okay. That means I will have four portions of data. So that means on each, and I have a two node cluster, and so that so that means on each node I want I will need two shards. So I have to add one more parameter over here that is max shards per node. So that way per node I will have two shards, and in total I will have four shards, two actual shards, and two copies that is replicas. But at this time you are not saying how to shard. How do means? It means what data goes to shard one, what goes to shard two. Yeah, so there are two type of routers. So th that is another thing called document routing. So that also you can control. Okay. I will explain it. Yeah. Uh, is it necessary to specify max number of shards? If you are creating more than the default value is one. So if you have only two solar nodes running, then you will be able to only create one shard and one replica or two shards with zero replicas. So by default, it will accept only one shard for one node. If you want to change that, uh, then uh, we need to override this. In production, we don't. Most of the times, we don't do this. In production, we always keep one host, uh, one uh, one node to host one portion of a shard. You can have multiple collections on a machine. So you suppose you have two machines cluster. You can have multiple collections on those two machines. You can have say 20 collections on those different machines. But for each collection. How many parts of that one collection you want on that machine? So in production cases, we only want one part of uh, that collection to be on that machine, so that it goes. If that goes down, I will have some replica on some different machine. If I specify two shards in production, then what happens is it might create replica and shard both things on the same machine. So if uh, the my uh, if my machine goes down, then I will lose both my shard and replica. So now it has created four different uh, shards. So and it has given this is the default name. You can uh, provide uh, name also what you want. But by default it names it like that. Collection one, shard one, replica two, shard two, replica two, shard one, replica one, like that. Now if I again go in go in cloud mode, I will see like this. Uh, collection one. So my collection one is uh, broken into two shards, and each of these shards. Has, will have two copies. Out of these copies, it automatically chooses some leader. Okay, so now comes how will we index uh, documents. So before indexing, uh, what it does it it will first go to one node obviously, and then from one node it will be copied and replicated over to other replicas. So which node will be chosen as leader? So this leader election is uh, so for this leader election, what it does is. Uh, while creating a collection, it first goes to Zookeeper, and this is the task of Zookeeper to tell it uh, which all nodes are alive. Out of those alive nodes, it will uh, select one of the nodes as leader, and the leader will take all the incoming uh, indexing uh, read and write requests. So, like for collection one, uh, while before creating collection one, the solar guy went to Zookeeper and asked you, uh, tell me what is the number of alive nodes. So it told that okay, there are two alive nodes. Then it selected one of them as leader. 
for every shard a leader is chosen so for shard 1 this node is chosen leader and um, by chance for shard 2 this node is chosen as leader so whenever i index something it will first go into uh, this shard 1 and then it will be replicated to uh, the shard on 2002 so zookeeper is responsible for choosing the leader whether request so zookeeper is telling uh, responsible for telling which nodes are alive okay. then this leader uh, election code is i mean on solar the only thing it uh, this zookeeper guy has is this cluster state file so if you see this cluster state file then it has information about all the shards so first thing you will see that it has the state of that shard then it has range so this range actually tells which document to put where it is basically a hash so before indexing it create a hash and based on this range it decides where to put that document where means which shard which shard now you can control this this uh, this uh, routing document routing you can specify your multiple level uh, route uh, routers uh, okay let's uh, just try to index uh, some documents into cloud mode in cloud mode so in this solar j there is a cloud indexer um, file if you will just run it it will index some documents it will index four documents into solar cloud and you can change that hash function you you have to specify that in your id so if you will see so now i went to this 2001 port and i selected this collection one uh, collection one shard one collection one shard one replica two you will notice that first let me select uh, do i start select uh, star query on this so you will see that we have uh, four documents Uh, but when I went to this collection one shard one replica two, you will see that I only have it is only showing num docs equal to one because this shard one is only hosting uh, one document and the other document will be other three documents will be in other shards. So it almost try to balance based on this automatic shard range. It almost try to balance the uh, number of documents each shard will receive, but it will be sometimes a little bit low high. Yeah, so, so this is the high level architecture whenever uh, there is zookeeper, uh, there is a zookeeper cluster then all this shard and replica they talk to zookeeper and then based on that they decide where to and what to do. This is the terminology. Yeah, when to, so yeah, question is sharding strategy so this is very important part uh, of like how to shard how many shards to have versus how many collections to have so the most basic uh, implementation practice is uh, uh, whenever you have a large very large for a small data set it doesn't matter put anything anywhere it doesn't matter as long as your data is uh, fitting inside your ram then it doesn't matter you can and you are, don't have very secret query latency uh, problems then it doesn't matter but if you are running into scaling issues then how what you can do is first of all you can divide your data into multiple collections uh, suppose you are into analytics and you are getting data for a month then what you can do instead of putting all the month data into a single collection uh, you can split that data into multiple collections and then solar provide a facility or api called collection aliasing and using that aliasing what you can do is you can abstract the splitted collections. You can tell Solar that even though you have splitted your data into multiple collections, but you can create an alias which will say master collection and you can direct all your reads to that master collection. It will read data from all those collections and return you results. 
the other thing comes up like in how many shards, how many shards should I have uh, for my data. So that again depends on, uh, so the no number of shards you have, the more you are distributing it among the, your CPUs. So that goes to what level of query latency you want to have. So in most of the case, on, on one machine you can have like 8 to 10 shards and it will perform well. So it, I mean, on, it depends on what collections to have and what shards to have. It depends on use case and what latency, exact latency you want to have. But uh, solar scales very well in creating large number of collections as well as creating large number of shards and cores on any number of machines. Uh, yeah, so uh, one thing is you can have multiple collections. Other thing is you want to control which document goes to which shard. So this you can have, uh, before that uh, replication, uh, first thing is solar is not, there is no master slave, anything like that. There is no master node, no slave node. Um, whenever a node goes down, solar talks to zookeeper. It elects a, if a replica goes down, no problem. If a leader goes down, uh, solar talks to zookeeper, it will, it, there will be a new leader election. As long as one replica is alive for all the shards, solar will process, it will give you the responses. If every, if uh, all the replica for a shard goes down, then solar will tell that, okay, all the sh replicas are down for some shard, I cannot give you response. In that case, you can override that warning and you can say that, okay, whatever data you have, give me that. So th that you can do. Yeah, so you can have, custom routing also. By default it will create hash but if you want to have your custom routing you can have that and that you can do by having a tri-level uh, ID. So this is the syntax. Suppose you are having three domains and you have data for three domains and you know that while querying user only query for one domain data. So you can uh, specify the domain name as the first, uh, first part of the routing key. Then this is the exclamation mark is the syntax. And then you can, so you can have basically three level of routing. So domain one, then other field based on that field you can have routing. So you can specify your own uh, routing key. Or while indexing, you have to create this uh, route key. That's the only thing. So how it indexes, whenever, a so cloud solar server is a smart client. Whenever we are indexing something, just now we indexed using SolarJ. So what it did was it first went to Zookeeper it got the cluster state. Based on cluster state, it got, it got the uh, shard to which it should index. It got the shard data. First, it will write the thing to a transaction log. So as soon as it's written to transaction log, you can see those results. After writing to transaction log, this leader will replicate the results to other replicas. Whatever replica, it will, have, will be there for this shard too. So it will write to uh, this. Then uh, after when the replication is complete, it will return you uh, that. Okay, interesting data. Same goes for querying. Uh, whenever we uh, query for anything, it will first go to Zookeeper. It will get any uh, shard uh, on which it should query. And then uh, based on that, uh, it will get the results and uh, return it. So one thing is while querying is in solar cloud mode actually uh, uh, is uh, if you are, as far as possible, if you don't need all the fields, uh, don't ask for all the fields, whatever fields you know, need, and just get those fields. And lot of production use case, we only index documents in solar, and based on the ID, we, we do a mapping between the index to some other external database. So, so what you do is, you only get the ID from the solar for a matching document, and for that equivalent ID, you get the actual result set from any external database. So in that case, there is very good optimization if you are only querying for ID field. So if you are only need ID field, then uh, just do field equal to none. Yeah, you can, uh, even after setting up the shards, suppose uh, right now while creating collection, you mentioned that you need two shards for a collection. You can always go ahead and create even more shards. It's very dynamic, it's very, very flexible. So. We have collections API for creating collections and doing all sort of things. Uh, quickly, I will explain this performance factors. So first, so performance factors basically lie on these four things. Uh, your schema design, that is the most important part. And this is the part where uh, most of the performance issue happens when we are starting for the first time. Because uh, 
uh, solar comes bundled with the example folder and it has everything turned on by default and lot of additional stuff which we don't need. So most of the time folks just take reference from example folder and start building it up. So it has lot of index field which we don't even use, copy fields and lot of an, an additional stuff. So first thing which, which you should do even before taking your product to production is clean up the schema, understand what all thing does and anything which you don't need is uh, remove those things. Even uh, people have seen difference of like 10x to 20x performance benefit by just cleaning up the schema. So that is the level of harm that this uh, wrong schema can do. Then the other thing is omit norms. Um, it is where it takes a lot of JVM. So if you are as far as you don't worry about the normalized score of your field, you can just turn off this omit norms. Um, because what happens is you know if you turn omit norm on, then for every field and in every document, it will store one additional um, bit of data. So when you are talking about billions of documents, then it adds up to like uh, very large amount of RAM and it totally kills uh, your GBM performance. Term vectors and doc values, other these things are a few, as long as you don't need it, just uh, term vectors turn off. Doc values, when you are faceting on very huge number of, when you are faceting and when you are sorting on any field which have very high cardinality, very high number of unique values, then you can definitely try this thing. It's very good for performance. Oh, caches, I totally missed, but caches are the most, uh, the most, most important thing. So solar have caches for uh, different type of things. And whenever you are implementing your query, then try to cache as much thing as possible and be very specific what you put in the cache. So it's very intelligent. Solar caches are very smart and it is one of the reason why solar performs so well. So spend some time in understanding what each cache do and um, change your query based on that. Uh, indexing bulk updates uh, are always good. Then there is a commit strategy. So you need to be very smart about when you are committing. So committing takes a lot of resources. So you need to keep a balance between uh, uh, when, how much you are indexing and at what intervals you are doing the commits. Another thing is optimize. So optimize again is a very memory intensive operation, memory and CPU intensive operation. What it does is it, it improves the query speed, but it takes a lot of time to optimize it. So a lot of folks do optimize very frequently and that totally kills uh, performance. Querying side, yeah, uh, use I mean, be very smart and try to use as many as uh, filters as possible. So, solar something called FQ. Whatever you put in FQ, that goes into cache. And if you are using the same filters again, most of the times, what you will do is you will be reusing your filters. You are you are going to an e-commerce website. Okay, you will first select the category, then you will select some other things. So, put all those uh, while querying, put all those things in filter query, so that it will get in cached, and your subsequent queries are very fast. Yeah, so that's it. I guess I'm really sorry that I couldn't <laughs> try and we couldn't cover a lot of hands on. Uh, uh, can I, uh, so you mentioned if there was time you spent some time comparing solar to... Yeah, so solar, solar versus elastic search. No, actually, yeah, that is very important thing because uh, whenever you try to implement something, this is the first choice you have to make, uh, whether we should go with uh, solar or elastic search. Uh, we also did some study like, uh, what to use. So my personal, so whatever, what I personally feel is, um, first of all, I am little biased towards solar. So the reason for that is it's a Apache product. Okay. Um, tomorrow, anything can happen to Elasticsearch, you don't know. But solar is going to be there, Apache is going to be there. So nothing is going to happen to solar. Other thing is uh, very strong community, very strong developer community in, in solar compared to Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch also could, especially it has received a huge funding recently, so it will see more interest in that. Where Elasticsearch is good is that solar initially, solar is uh, did to very long back. The time it was written, it was not written for this uh, distributed functionality in mind. So Elasticsearch shines in the areas because it was written from ground up for distributed capabilities. So, APIs are a little bit smarter, you can say. So it's easy to get started. Sometimes people feel intimidated to set up all this zookeeper cluster. If you will go 
and see comparison online, then people will say that, oh, I have to set up Zookeeper cluster in solar. I don't have to do that in Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch automatically, internally use its own stuff. So that, but that is not a reason to go for any technology because it's not, you might feel for independent for the first time, but uh, and later you will um, realize that it's not that big of a deal. There are few features, so that uh, are available in solar, but not in elastic search and vice versa. So if you have any specific requirements before, um, I would say that go for solar. It's very good. And at least for us, uh, we have um, scaled it to billions of documents. We have very good uh, response time, very, uh, what to say, very reliable customers uh, and clusters. So I personally never saw any problem with using solar. So there are some features like there is a feature called percolator that is available in Elasticsearch. It is yet to come in solar. It is available through our external plugin. So if you need that feature, that is useful for a lot of cases. If you need that, uh, you can go for Elasticsearch. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, you have to decide for yourself what exactly is your use case and what feature do you need. Personally, for me, solar, I never saw any kind of problem with solar. Not scaling, configuration, developer help. So what I will do next is I will be sending a cheat sheet um, where I will provide you a lot of useful links uh, where you can go and refer. Plus I will write a uh, large document about how to use uh, this activity because we have to rush through most of the hands of session. So I will provide a document where you can use this activity folder and I will upload it somewhere. So that folks who could don't, couldn't get it, uh, then set up configure on your own machine instead of VM and just go through activities and try it yourself. Yeah, apart from that, yeah, if you have any questions, just drop me a mail. Yeah, I will be there for the rest of the conference. Thank you.